thing before that called no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Not so many people know about this song. This song was written by a man named Charles Weigel, and uh, it was copyrighted in the year 1932. And uh, Charles Weigel, or Charlie, as he was known, um, he was a evangelist. And as he, uh, as he was out preaching the word, he came home one day to find a note from his wife. And his wife said this, I'm leaving, Charlie. I want to go the other way to the bright lights. I no longer want to be an evangelist's wife. I'm taking my son. And with that heartbreak, he soon wrote the words, I would love to tell you about what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. And he did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind and true. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. The Christian life, I hope we know this, is a battleground. Christian life is not a playground. Though there's joy, and I want you to know, you hang around with me enough, you're going to know that I have a joyful life. I enjoy what God does, gives, I enjoy just everything around me. Are there times that my heart breaks? Absolutely. Are there times that there's serious trouble? Absolutely. But the reality is, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. My life is full. It's amazing. Not because it's perfect. Not because it's without its issues. Charles Weigel, before he penned this, he contemplated suicide. He was in deep depression. But can I tell you the key thing that we need to learn from him besides that was a pretty great song? Is that when everything was going down, he kept looking up. And that's not a trite expression. We have to understand that Jesus promised that this world is going to be hard. This world is going to be tough. This world is going to be full of heartaches from within and from without. But only Jesus has the answer. Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis, please. Genesis chapter 20. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 20. In Genesis chapter 20, Starting with verse 1, I'm just going to read the chapter. By the way, we've already read one chapter today. Whew, that's a lot. We need a little less Bible in church, amen? <laughs> Genesis chapter 20, starting with verse 1, And Abraham journeyed from thence, going uh, uh, thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and journeyed to Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, Will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocency of my hands, have I done this? And God said unto him in a dream, yea, 
I know that thou didst, did this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou shalt restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And wh what have I offended thee? that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, It's okay, baby. That's not what he said. I was talking to Reuben. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou, that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father and the daughter of my mother. Not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. And Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservant, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech, because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, it has been said of me that in every sermon I ever preach, um, I will usually mention at least one of two things. I will either mention something about Disney or something about Star Wars. Let my track record continue. Without a doubt, the greatest sequel ever made in the history of mankind is The Empire Strikes Back. Amen, brother. All right, that's good. I like it. Pastor, do you really like Star Wars? Oh, yeah, I sure do. Now, I remember as a kid, one, okay, I'm this old, right? I remember sitting in the, in the cinema with my father watching the original Star Wars, and all I want to do was go back and go back and go back. And a couple of years later, in around 79, when I heard that they were making a sequel to Star Wars, boom, my mind just exploded. And then I went and I saw this masterpiece of film. Now, I was only nine at the time. The film came out in 1980. And, and this is when, uh, you know, Darth Vader confessed that he was his father. And Luke screamed no and jumped off. And I want you to know, I knew Darth Vader was lying. I knew that there was no way he could really be Luke Skywalker's dad. And I remember literally getting in fights at school over this very, and I mean fights. Then I found out that I was wrong. And I was so mad at Obi-Wan for deceiving me for this. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can hang out and you come over to our place after church and we can watch this fine bit of film. But there are some sequels that should never have been made. Parents, 
Have any of you ever been suckered into buying some of those straight to uh, home video uh, sequels that Disney made? The sequel to Hercules. Anybody ever see that one? Terrible. Anybody ever see the one, uh, the sequel to Pocahontas? It hurts my eyes. And the, 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 they're terrible. They really are. Sometimes sequels should never be made, but sometimes the reason why some sequels should never be made is because the first one wasn't brilliant to begin with. Let me continue in our history of film. When they came out with the, uh, what is it, Steve Martin movie, Pink Panther, it was, meh. it's okay. There was nothing else on at the cinema for about 12 months. So it just kind of did well. And then some brainiac said, let's make a part two to this. And it was terrible. And it did terrible. And they were all shocked. And I said, well, duh, it wasn't good in the first place. Nobody was really that vested in it. Why do you do something again when it was terrible in the first place? This, what, pastor, why are you taking down this straw? I thought we were in church. We are. Here's the point. When I read this story of Abraham and Sarah lying to a king that she is his sister and not his wife, did that sound familiar to anyone? You're like, this is a sequel, and it, didn't, it wasn't good in the first place. And here we are seeing this sequel. The Bible says, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Probably at no greater time in the history of the world are we more of an undisciplined people. We don't go to war anymore. For the most part, right? I mean, I, I'm glad for that. I, I, I hope that we don't have town centers with great monuments to all the men who died in a war that we're still shaking our heads. Why did it even happen in the first place? We live in a time where we don't struggle to survive. I'm not saying that uh, if you're on the dole, you're going to live at the pinnacle of everyone else, but the reality is, is you can survive. They'll make sure that you have a house. They'll make sure that you have your basics. And let's face it, the basics that we have today, most of our grandparents didn't have that luxury. I remember my grandparents in London and Hackney, I remember them just having a little space heater. And, and, and that would go, they, wouldn't, they, they couldn't afford to heat the whole house. This is when you still stuck uh, money in the back of the TV. Remember those good old days? And, and money in the lights. Remember that? I, I, yeah, I remember that. And, uh, and, and, and they took a little space heater wherever they went. We don't really suffer. And so we kind of tend to be a little bit of a soft people who are afraid to suffer. I would say our Christianity is pretty much the same. And the reason why it's the same is not because the gospel is any less, but because we don't understand how righteous God is. We don't understand how holy God is. Church, if we grasped truly who God was, truly who He is, truly who He will always be, I promise you things will change. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way the only truth and the only life, and no man can come to the Father but by Him. Does anybody believe that? I see that I, everybody is saying yes, except for those who are on their phones right now. 
Is it too busy? I don't know. Do we believe that he that believeth on the Son hath life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him? Who in here believes that first? Fewer people. <laughs> May I say that if we truly believe that, our actions would be different. I think we know it, but I don't think we believe it. Do we truly believe that it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment? I know the marshes and I know the Ortezes, I, I know they, they had a, a big bout of illnesses in their family a couple of months ago. And uh, I know there was a point where you were just like, I don't know, I can't remember feeling well again. <laughs> I, I don't remember what it was like not to have my head feel like it stopped up with concrete. You, and if you don't know what that means, you will know this what, that in about three or four weeks, okay? Because the cold and flu season is just going to march in and everybody's uh, dying. And trying to rest, your head is trying to suffocate you and you just can't breathe. What I'm trying to say is that when we truly, wholeheartedly believe in what God says, it will change us. The state of the manse while my wife is gone is not bad. Natalia, I think you came over once during it. It wasn't terrible, was it? No, it was not. But I promise you, because I know my wife is coming back on Thursday, I promise you Dakota and I will have uh, some serious projects that we will do. Okay? Because I believe something, my actions will take care of it. Uh, we, we, we have a little baby back there. and What a good baby, right? Right? Takes after his mom, not his dad. And, uh, and you know, as her belly was getting bigger, they realized that something had happened. Now, you, you had a baby in you. Now, you, you know how we knew that they believed that? Because they began to start planning and start changing and, and, and everything was, was being moved towards that direction. They were in preparation for it. How foolish would it have been for them to say, yes, I'm pregnant. Yes, this is going to happen, but not take a single action accordingly. You'd have to say there's some amazing type of foolishness. My, my whole point going back to this is that if, if we do not Forsake and confess our sin before God, Christian. We are doomed to constantly repeat it. The problem with our churches today is not that we are lukewarm. Listen carefully. The problem with our churches today is not that we're lukewarm. The problem is we're lukewarm about being lukewarm. The problem is we've heard so many sermons where we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm lukewarm. But that's the end of it. And so many times we go into a church and, and the word of God is preached and the spirit moves in our heart and we thump our chest and we go forward and, and you know, we shake our head. And as soon as we go out that door, life is the exact same. Can we agree that's a problem? Christian, I love that God records Genesis chapter 20. Because here we have the man of God, the prophet of God, doing the same stupidity. I want you to think for a moment. Too many times we just read the Bible and we don't think about it. Maybe you have a Bible that has uh, things at the top of your Bible that describes what goes on. But this is where I require something for you, okay? 
If, if, you don't, if you don't give me any feedback, it's double tithe. I don't make the rules. But in chapter 17, I have two questions that I'm going to ask. How old was Abraham? And what was the promise? Genesis chapter 17. Does anybody know how old Abraham was? He was 99 years old. And the promise that Sarah is going to have this child a promise. Chapter 18. God visits Abraham and Sarah, gives them a name change, and reinforces that through Sarah will come the child of promise. Now, how old was Abraham in chapter 17? Okay, okay, I'll give you a hint. The answer will be 99, okay? How old is Abraham in chapter 17? 99, okay. In chapter 21, in verse 3, how old is he when Isaac is born? Come on, Hannah. N no. I get, in, in chapter 21, verse 3, yeah, he's 100. All right. Last quiz. 100 take away 99 is what? One year. Okay, so from chapter 17 to chapter 21 is one year. 17 to 21 is one year, and we're in chapter 20. Would you say that there's a pretty darn good chance that Sarah's pregnant at this point? His wife, who was told that she's going to hold the blessing that will produce nations, produce people, and produce salvation. That child very well is probably in her womb. I don't think it's a stretch to say that. How careless is he? How terrible is he? He's more afraid of what could happen humanly than his confidence of what God can do. See, Christian, this is where the breakdown happens. The breakdown happens is when he came out of Egypt, he started doing the right thing, but it doesn't look like he's confessed and forsaken his sin. It doesn't look like he went to Sarah and said, we're not going to do this again. Because he remember when Abimelech said, why are you doing this? He says, well, my wife and I, we, we, you know, wherever we went, this is just our story. Because it's not a complete lie. Don't you love it when your kids... Don't tell you a complete lie. I, 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 you know, when they tell you a half truth. Uh, Mom, Dad, uh, you know, uh, the cup was there. And, uh, and all I know is that when I came into the room, it was smashed. What they forget to tell you is they're in the other room kicking a football. And it hit the cup, and it smashed. But sure enough, when they walked in, it was smashed. Right? That's why we always taught our kids, a half-truth is a whole lie. 
But Abraham, he was used to the deception. In verse 3, it continues. It says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Christian, the reason why Abraham did many of his schemes is because he forgot that God can also work in other people. How many of you honestly believe the fact that the Spirit will lead you to do things? Now, if the Spirit is leading you to do something, couldn't he also be working in another person to receive what you're going to say? Now, you can say whatever you want about Calvinists, okay? And I'm not here to defend any position, but I will tell you something. Some of the actual greatest soul winners that I've met, personally, have been Calvinists, and I'll tell you why. They're not fatalists, at least the ones I've met. They say, well, if God has sovereignly led me to give the gospel, then he must sovereignly be leading somebody to listen to the gospel. Man, I like that, don't you? Don't you like the idea that if God is burdening your heart, he's also burdening somebody else's heart to listen? We have got to be in that position where we understand that God is not just doing a work in us, he's also doing a work out there. And the people that we meet, the people that, um, uh, that, that surround us, I want you to know God can be burdening them with something. When you go, hey, listen, I, I was just wondering, would you like to come to church with me on Sunday? Man, would I ever. Man, would I ever. You, you may be like the type of person where you, where you offer that, and before they even get a chance to say yes, you go, oh, but, but I understand you, you'll probably be way too busy. I don't want to burden you. You know, but it's just out there if you want, but if you don't want, it's all cool. You know, when people are going through stuff, it's okay to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I want to be as polite as I can, but I want everybody to listen. There are two people that are on their phones right now and I'm going to do my best not to call you out. But if you stay on your phones, I'm going to call you out. I love you with all my heart. But the word of God is too important to be preached while you're faffing about. Okay. Sorry for that. We see in verses 3 and 4 that as as, as Abraham sinned, as Abraham was doing wrong, God was able to wake Abimelech up in a dream. That God was able to work. Reuben, I wasn't talking about you, buddy. You weren't on your phone. I know you weren't. God's acts are never done in a vacuum. Do you notice what he says in verse 4? He says, Abimelech... It, Tells God, God, will you um, slay also a righteous nation? Where does that come from? What just happened in the chapter before this? The destruction of Sodom, Gomorrah, and those other nations of the plains. And by the way, everybody knew that they were wicked and that they should be destroyed. And they knew that God's wrath came down. And so, and so Abimelech says this, Lord, we're not involved in that kind of stuff. God, we're not the type of people that go stealing other people's uh, wives. God, I, we get that you destroyed these wicked people. We get that you destroyed those nations. But Lord, will you also destroy us? Because we haven't done that. If you look in verse 4, where he said, Lord, wilt thou 
slay also a righteous uh, nation. Do you see that word Lord? This is the Hebrew word Adonai. Why is that important? How did Abimelech hear about Adonai? He heard it because Adonai, the righteous God, said enough and he judged sin. And who God was went around. I'm not saying every nation got right with God, but they knew who the true God was. By the way, do you know what Adonai means? It's the plural form of Lord. Lord of Lords. Just like Elohim is the plural form of the one true God, Adonai is a plural form of the Lord of Lords. Now, throughout Israel's history, they always knew that there was how many gods? One. But yet, in the names of God, so many times we see the hint of a plural form because the Trinity is not a New Testament invention. From the very beginning, God said, let us make man in our own image. Verse 5. Said she not unto me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he is my brother? No, Sarah's in the deception business now, isn't she? Ladies, let me tell you something. This is not how the Bible wants wives to submit themselves to their own husbands. God never asks you to submit to sin. Never. Never. Don't. Don't. Don't submit to sin. Abraham was wicked in making his wife an accomplice. There is no compulsion by the God of the universe for you to obey sin. Sometimes you have to make a godly stand to keep your character. And maybe you will lose everything else. Do you remember Joseph? Do you remember when Potiphar's wife kept on saying, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me, sleep with me? And finally, uh, she got alone with him and grabbed him by his robe and said, now is the time, lie with me. And he pulled himself away and pulled himself away. She wouldn't let go of his robe. He ended up just wiggling out of his robe and running down the halls without a robe, okay? And Joseph lost his robe, but he kept his character. And how was he rewarded for that? Went to prison. Pre went to prison for a while. It wasn't a cushy prison either. May I say that sometimes you'll make a stand for righteousness and the reward for that is suffering? But is he worthy? Verse 6 continues. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a liar, a deceiver, I, he's, he, he doesn't do the right thing. Is that what it says? Shake your head this way or this way. No, that's not what it says. What does God call the person who started this deception, who led his wife down deception, who endangered the promised child, who was not doing what, what God said? What does God call this person? A prophet. Man, if God can call a guy like Abraham a prophet, aren't you glad what that means about you? He's not giving up on you either. 
I hear so many times people go, oh, yeah, but, uh, you know, once you do this, it's all over. Once you do this, it's all over. Once you do this, it's all over. Uh, we find all that rolled up in the life of Abraham. And you know what? God still says, he's mine. I'll, I'll claim him even if no one else will. Christian, you are his, and he claims you even if no one else will. Even if you made an absolute dog's breakfast of your life, God loves you. God wants you. You are his if you're born again. Amen? And despite Abraham being in the midst of a lie that could have defiled his wife, the child of promise, Abimelech, Abimelech's kingdom, and the future Messiah, that never stopped God from using Abraham. I'd also like to say this. God called Abraham a prophet, and we don't even find Abraham repenting yet, do we? And so many times people will say, well, if you do wrong, God's, God's done with you until you repent, and then God, God will start liking you again. That is not scriptural. Now, by the way, you know what else is not scriptural? That you can just stay in sin, continue in sin, live your life in sin, years and years of sin, uh, decades of sin, and, uh, and, and, and God will just leave you to it. No, God's a good father. God's a good father. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he chastises. And it brings about the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Well, God calls Abraham a prophet. And then he tells Abimelech, and he shall pray for thee. Now, honestly, if I was God, I might keep that part quiet. I, I might say, look, he, he's my man, but he's done wrong. Just kind of push him aside and I'll deal with him later. You know what God says? He's my man and he's going to pray for you. He's done you wrong. He's the reason why you're in this mess. And he, my man, is going to pray for you. How unworthy are we that God still uses us? Church, what I want us to desperately see in this is, is this terrible sequel to Abraham's extremely terrible decisions did not warrant God saying, I've had enough. He uses him. He says, Abraham's going to pray for you and you will live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that is thine. Man, think about that. Think about that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God does not repent of his gifts. God does not repent of his calling on people. They're without repentance. Do you think that when God called Abraham, it caught him by surprise of the way he would act in Egypt? Do you think it caught God by surprise the way he would act uh, it, with the Abimelech kingdom? Of course not. God knew everything that was going to happen. And yet we still find those sparks of not where we find Abraham always doing, but Abraham believing God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Christian, whatever state you're in, it, you're never too far gone. You haven't crossed over the Rubicon of your spiritual life where there's no going back. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Believer, there's never going to be a time where you stop being his. Verse 9, 
Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And this prophet of God is rightly being rebuked by this heathen king. This heathen king looks at God's man and says, God's man, why did you do this? This heathen king looked at the representative of God on earth and he says, what have I done? How have I, how have I done so wickedly that you would do this? And the statement that he says, the things thou hast done deeds unto me, that ought not to be done. Christian, are there people in your life that can look at you and say, Christian, you've done deeds that ought not to be done. Can your life be exposed in a way where people can look at you and go, a, a Christian, these are deeds that ought not to be done. This is not a trick question. This is a question for you to understand who you are. You don't need to raise your hand, but mentally raise your hand. If you're righteous in here, mentally raise your hand. Some of you are like, oh, no, I do this, I do this. No, 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 hold on a second. God has called you righteous. Not because of your goodness, but because of his. Amen? Now, mentally, raise your hand on that. Yes, actually, I am righteous. Not only are you that, but you are a king. You are part of, a, of royalty. You're also part of a royal priesthood. We've been called to be intercessors. We have been called to be holy. There's a, there's a, a story of a medieval king whose son every once in a while would go kind of off the rails while he was visiting other kingdoms. And then uh, there would be a ransom for him to come. And, and one day, of course, his son acted like his son and was wicked throughout this kingdom, did whatever he wanted. And the king was told, look, there's a ransom for your son um, or he's going to be executed. And the father went to this foreign kingdom. The father went to this prison. And the father saw his son and paid for his release. And then grabbed a hold of his son by both shoulders and looked him square in the eye and said, Son, change your life or change your name. Christians, if we are called by God, we are His people. And I think probably so many of us are guilty that people can point at us and say, the deeds which you have done should not have been done. And they certainly shouldn't have been done to me. So what do we do? Well, now it's time to act like a prophet. You get those things right. You confess your sin where it needs to be confessed. And you walk righteously. You walk in the light of Him who has called you. Christian, nobody should be able to point a finger like they pointed a finger at Peter and said, you're one of His, I'm sure of it. Nope, nope, I don't know the man. How difficult would it have been Peter to witness to that person later on? Let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, Jesus, the one you don't know, that Jesus. Oh, let me tell you how Jesus can change your life. Like he's changed yours. This pulpit 
may be on a high position, but I promise you I'm not speaking as from one on high. It's time for us to confess and forsake. Confess and forsake. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? What in my life did you see? What about this made you say, I'm going to deceive him and bring this great curse on me? And verse 11, And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. The problem was not that there was no fear of God in the country that Abraham was going to. The problem is that there was no fear of God in Abraham's heart at that moment. He didn't fear the Lord, he feared man. And church, we need to stop being so scared of everything that's around us. We need to be the people that make a holy stand and say, you know what? Uh, no, no matter what happens, I'm a believer, and I don't care if anybody's with me, I'm going forward with Christ. You'll never know what it's like. Dakota has seen this before. We had a ministry to Eritrean people. And the Eritreans, for being a believer, they were persecuted. And when I mean persecuted, they were thrown in prison. Their pastors were shot. And we were able to start a, a, a church of these Eritreans in Manchester. And one day they, they said, Pastor, can, can we sing a song? Yeah. And they sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. That's the type of Christianity. That's the type of gumption Christians need to have. I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's it. I heard a preacher one time say, the only decision you need to make is to decide to follow Jesus. Every other decision will be made after that. If you go to verses 12 and 13 of chapter 20, Abraham continues, and yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife, and it came to pass when God caused me to want... This almost reminds me of like, Adam, the woman, Lord, which thou gave me. Verse 12, and it came to pass when God caused us to wonder, when God really put us in these bad situations, we had to decide how we were going to fix things. Then I said unto her, this is thy kindness, which thou shalt show me at every place whither we shall come, save me, he is my brother. Does anybody see an ounce of repentance in Abraham yet? No. Not an ounce. As a matter of fact, it looks more like me, like Abraham is justifying his sin. Can I give you a verse, please? Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. I won't read it until all eyes are there because this is an important verse. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them 
shall have mercy. Stop trying to cover everything. Just say, you know what? It was wrong. Confess and forsake. Don't cover. Confess and forsake. Abraham was still trying to conf- uh, try to cover. What he should have done is said to Abimelech, I have sinned against the God of heaven. I've sinned against you, and I've caused a lot of problems. But he never did. Do you know what kingdom Abimelech is the great, 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 great grandfather of? The Philistines. Two of the great thorns in the flesh of Israel is Egypt and the Philistines. The two kingdoms that the prophet of God lied to and brought harm upon their kingdoms because of his lie was Egypt and Philistine. Think about that for a second. Christian, what we do has great consequence. It's funny, it's, 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 it's like in school. It's like, and it, it's, it's our heart that shows just the wickedness of us. You know, what, what, when the teacher looks at you and, they, and, 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 and there's nowhere to turn, and instead of doing the right thing, then you try to get a little bit more sneaky, that you put the book up and you do something behind the book, like the teacher's an idiot. There's no stupidity there. There's a reality that this is simply exposing the heart. Verses 14 through 16. Go back to Genesis chapter 20. By the way, I'm still kind of riled up over the last two weeks' sermons about Lot, so (laughs) I should be okay by next week. My wife will say, shh, calm down, it's okay. Verse 14, And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. Isn't it a shame when the heathen act better than God's people? Isn't that a shame? So many times in Christians' lives, so many times, well, let me rephrase this, so many times when I witness to people, the reason why they are rejecting the gospel is not because of the truth of the gospel, not that it speaks to their heart, but because they've had people that were close to them that were terrible testimonies. And they look around and go, you know what, the world doesn't even act this way. Why would I come to Christ? And Abimelech, he kind of seals it here, because in verse 16, he looks at Sarah and says, Behold, I have given thy brother... Can you, can you almost hear the sarcasm? Look, if, if, if you don't read the scriptures knowing the emotions of the people, you're not reading it well. Because the whole problem was that Sarah agreed with this lie. Oh yeah, he's my brother. And Abimelech says, all right, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver because he is to thee a covering of thine eyes and all that are with thee, and all other. He, basically it's this, okay, your brother, you and, you and your brother have a pretty weird relationship. He's hinting at some other things. He's, he's kind of being, he's upset. And that's why in the end of verse 16, it says, and she was reproved. Verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God, 
And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservant. And they bare children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Notice that God healed after Abraham prayed. Christian, even though there's sin, even though we've done terrible things, God has not called us to give up. God has called us to still have a ministry of reconciliation. Still, we have a ministry of intercession. Still, we've got to pray for people. Yes, some, this is why Satan likes us to sin and sin with other people and sin openly, because when you sin with other people, it is very difficult to give them the gospel next. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, sin in the life of a believer will make him a coward. Christian, Satan already lost you. But if he can make you afraid to speak to people about the gospel because you fear them, oh, that's one up. But if better yet, he can put you in a compromising position so that you won't even mention the name of God. Can a Christian rob a bank? Yes or no? Sure. Kids, this is not saying go ahead and rob a bank and you can do that as a Christian. No, we don't hear about many Christian bank robbers for a reason. But sure, it's possible for a Christian to rob a bank, I guess. So you're robbing a bank. And, uh, and while everybody's moving the money out, out, out of the uh, vault, you know, the, the Christian says, by the way, while we're doing this, I want you to realize the real riches are in heaven. You know, Jesus saved me from my sins. And he could do the same thing for you. Well, that's a tremendous testimony, amen? What do the movies, what do the TV shows, what do they all do? They always show the hypocrite of, of the Christian. And they show that so that you are automatically, even though you're not even involved in it, you're already on the back foot. Christian, the reason why the wicked one wants you to get involved in sin is because it kills your testimony. It makes you look like a hypocrite. So what should you do after you sin? Should you just, I guess I should move to Manchester. I guess I need to move to Scotland, the Orkney Islands, you know, somewhere far, far away where no one knows me. No, what you need to do is you need to immediately start the ministry of reconciliation. Like Abraham did. And you know what? It was a tough road up for him to do what's right. But he couldn't just quit. Christian, you can't just quit. Okay, you've blown it. All right. You're sitting in a room of people where half of them will acknowledge that they've blown it, and the other half just don't want to tell anybody. We've blown it. So what do we do? A righteous man falls seven times. but you get back up. I'm not trying to go back to another movie of Batman. Why did we fall down so we could get back up? But there's something there, I think, in that statement. You can't fall a second time if you refuse to get up after the first time. We have a lost and dying world that desperately needs us to be the light that we're supposed to be, that we need to be the salt that we're supposed to be. And if we've messed up, well, it's time to say, you know what, I've messed up and keep going forward. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I could be ashamed of me sometimes. I've had some regrets sometimes. But the gospel doesn't make me stop. 
the gospel presses me forward. Christian, all right, it's time to get up. Time to dust off. Time to be a prophet of God. Time to be an intercessor. Time to get busy with what he's called us to do. No more bad sequels in our lives, okay? Let's pray.